This is not what has happened so far. That is a thing profoundly to regret. But it can still happen, and it should. Even more regrettably, the assault on Hussein is by no means an isolated instance. Sarir Tripathi, writing in Mint, mentions the protest in Andhra Pradesh recently uh, against Yarla Gada Lakshmi Prasad, who was honored for his Telugu novel, Draupadi. Barber's Tripathi continues, forced Shah Rukh Khan to change the name of the film. The Shiv Sena takes on Sachin Tendulkar and Mukesh Ambani, who say but Mumbai belongs to all Indians. And the paper tigers in Mumbai threaten to disrupt Shah Rukh Khan's new film, My Name is Khan. To these examples, one could add the bizarre Indian opposition to a proposed film starring Kate Blanchett as Edwina McBatten, a film that intended to deal with the well-known deep relationship between that lady and Jawaharlal Nehru, even such historical speculation is now deemed offensive to Indian sensitivities. There is also, of course, the sad case of Taslima Nasreen, whose Indian visa will apparently not be renewed, and a few years ago the appalling attack on the Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute in Pune, um, merely because the historian James Lane had done research there while writing a biography of Shivaji, to which the Sambhaji Brigade, the militant youth wing of the Maharashtra Seva Sangh, objected. The Lane biography was, of course, immediately banned and remains banned to this day. Can it really be that Indians believe that Lane and BORI were blameworthy for the Sambhaji Brigade's attack? That Sachin Tendulkar and Mukesh Ambani are to blame for stating the obvious truth that all India is free for all Indians? That Shah Rukh Khan is to blame for speaking in favor of Pakistani cricketers participating in the IPL? I'm sorry to say that it's beginning to look as if these blatant inversions of the truth may be thought of as the truth by a large, if unquantifiable, proportion of today's Indians. And here I come to my point about the wider responsibility of the citizenry as a whole. It should be said that the growth of a culture of complaint, as the Australian critic Robert Hughes has called it, is not by any means unique to India. It sometimes seems in Britain, in America, and everywhere that various groups, not just religious groups, but racial and sexual groups as well, have begun to define themselves by the things that offend them most, which is to say to define themselves negatively by what they are against, rather than positively and creatively by what they are for. If nothing much offends you these days, then, well, who are you? We are in danger of thinking of our rage as the characteristic that expresses us best. Whereas, in my opinion, the surrender to anger is always a weakness and one of the worst aspects of being human. At the heart of the anti Hussein position is this culture of offendedness, which justifies itself according to the crude logic of Mosaic law, an eye for an eye, two wrongs make a right, what's source for the goose is source for the gander. And my own example, I regret to say, has been used as an argument. If my work is unacceptable because of its alleged aff affront to Muslim sensibilities, then Hussein is unacceptable because Hindu sensibilities matter just as much. I have two replies to this. The first is that I do not agree that the treatment of my work in India has been or is proper. Even if we speak only of tactics rather than ethics, most of those who protested against the Satanic Verses in 1988 and 89 have accepted that their protests were counterproductive and misguided. Even if we speak only of due process rather than ethics, India banned this book without even going through the motions of its own regulations on censorship. Even if we speak only of the contents of the work rather than ethics, any reader of mine can find in my books Muslims drawn sympathetically as well as unsympathetically, also good and bad Hindus, Christians, and Jews. My intention was never to lampoon any one community, but to look at human life as clearly as I can. Twenty-two years have passed since the furor over, over my book began in India, ignited, I'm sorry to say, by an article in India Today. <laughs> um, and I hope people, including journalists in India Today, see more clearly now. The Indian ban on the Satanic Verses was and is wrong. It should not be used to justify the current hostility being shown to M.F. Hussain. The second argument is that of Mahatma Gandhi, an eye for an eye, and the whole world goes blind. It is highly desirable for the cycle of attack and counterattack to end. There is sadly no sign that this end is near. This week, one reads, 
that the president of the Indian Center for Inquiry, Mr. Inaya Narasethi, and his colleagues Subarao and Macha Laksmaya, alias Krantikar, have been arrested for publishing an anthology named Crescent Over the World that has create, brought some Muslim rallies onto the streets. I have myself a bone to pick with these gentlemen, as it happens, since it, it appears that they have published a text of mine without seeking my permission. Uh, to this date, I have no idea what text they have published whether it has been accurately reproduced or falsified, and how it has been contextualized by the editors. This is shoddy behavior, and I deplore it. However, for the local police to give in to unruly protesters, seize copies of the book, and arrest its editors is even shoddier. Yet that is very often the state of affairs in India today. In matters of culture, the mob rules. Identity politics dominates the national discourse. On this question, identity politics, I am of the same mind as Amartya Sen. When we define our identities narrowly, as Hindus or Muslims, for example, we greatly increase the probability of discord. And in today's India, there is much impetus behind the move to force us to, into such narrow corners of self-definition. But all of us know that in reality, we all have plural identities. Any one of us may be, at any given moment, not only Hindu, but also a bald person, a father, a railway employee, a cricket fan, an asthmatic, a chess player, a movie lover. Identity is plural. We are all composite selves. The way we are with our children is not the way we are with our bosses. We are different again with our lovers and our friends. When we define our identities accurately in this multiple way, we immediately find things in common with other people boldness, parenthood, work, sport, illness, hobbies, pastimes. What we have in common is greater than what separates us. Yet we are in danger of forgetting this, of fencing ourselves into smaller and smaller enclaves and feeling threatened by everyone outside. When people retreat into these ever-diminishing fortresses uh, of religion or region or language, dissension and hostility escalate at once. We saw this on a continental scale after the fall of the Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall. It was as though Europeans, alarmed by their sudden freedom, created new, smaller Iron Curtains, new walls to hide behind, and at once conflict exploded, Serb against Croat and Bosnian, with bitter results. Now there is a real danger of such ideological enclosures imperiling what Sunil Kilnani called the idea of India. And as is so often the case, one of the primary battlegrounds chosen by the intolerant is the field of art and culture. We know the history of our age of the world. We know how often artists and intellectuals have taken the brunt of authoritarianism. We understand that the independent mind, the unfettered imagination, the uncensored vision of the artist, and yes, also the niggling and burrowing of the journalist, is feared by Chinese grandees and ayatollahs, by ideologues and barbarians. We have seen over and over in many countries how a writer, an artist, a film star is accused of what Orwell called thought crime, and at once the Stasi or the Securitate or the KGB or Savak come knocking at his door. In the Indian variation, however, we are not facing the authoritarianism of the state, for the state is weak, as we have seen but a rising tide of authoritarianism among sections of the people. And once again, it is art and ideas that face the brunt of the attack. Why is it so easy to mobilize public opinion against artists? So easy for the accusation of their alleged provocations to become the point rather than the violent reaction to their work. A painting, after all, a painting is an object in a space. If you don't like the idea of it, you do not have to enter that space and look at it. The notion that it provokes merely by existing somewhere on earth is irrational, yet it is an unreason many people see as reasonable. A book you don't like does not have to be purchased, nor does it have to be opened. This is in fact why we have books by different authors in our bookstores. Or if it is opened, it can be shut, at which point it presumably loses its ability to offend you. Um, <laughs> the, the, 
Yet, once again, the very existence of an unread book is seen as a sufficient provocation, causing injury and therefore becoming responsible for whatever injuries may subsequently be inflicted by the supposedly injured parties. The, sa the same, it seems, can be true of an unseen film or an unheard song. A part of the answer, why it's so easy to mobilize this kind of hostility, is, of course, that the arts are soft targets. They have no troops and they are vulnerable. Paintings can be destroyed, books can be burned, libraries can be devastated, film theaters can be menaced. That is pretty obvious. A more difficult part of the answer, however, may be that in India, not only in India, but also in India, people suspect artists. They are thought of as some sort of self-justifying elite, which is an extraordinary misconception in the light of how difficult, provisional, often ill-paid and unrecognized a life dedicated to the arts can be. Most writers, painters, musicians and actors struggle. Even those who become well-known have usually paid their dues with long years of penury and hardship. The idea of the arts as a vocation, a calling, which is how artists themselves see their profession, as a vocation of the same order as medicine or monasticism, is not widely accepted by the general public. So it is easy to paint artists as careerists, sensationalists, amoral hedonists, pursuing the modern deities of celebrity and wealth and carelessly blaspheming against the ancient deities as they do so. The arts have their followers, of course, and thank goodness for them, and those who love books, music, painting and films well know what it takes to create such works, the discipline, the dedication, the honesty, the integrity, the humility, the talent. But for the larger section of the population that has neither the time nor the inclination for the arts, artists are not serious people. As my father said on the day I told him I wanted to be a writer, what will I tell my friends? He, uh, <laughs> uh, he changed his mind some years later when his friends started calling him up to congratulate him. Uh, writing, painting, acting and so on are simply not thought of as proper jobs. Those who do them are easily depicted as egotistical layabouts, philanderers and drunks. And to help the accusation along, there are a few artists who are all of those. Uh, and once they have been so depicted, their work can easily be dismissed. There is one common feature to the attacks on M.F. Hussein and whoever else falls foul of the communalists' rage. Their work is not taken seriously. Hussein's use of the nude is used to attack him, and he has painted, the only thing he's painted more often than nudes is horses. Um, and the central role of the nude in the history of art is simply ignored or treated as alien and therefore wrong, as if art could be forced to obey narrowly nationalist def definitions of what it can and cannot be. Nor are artists taken seriously as individuals. Their characters are denigrated, their motives questioned, as well as their work derided. No matter how distinguished their careers, how great their recognition, how important their oeuvre, they become, once they are targeted, not much better than scum. This is so much easier than actually engaging with what you don't understand or don't like. Treat its creators as worthless, the work as less than worthless, and that justifies the assault. Again, this is by no means unique to India. Communism routinely denigrated the writers it persecuted, and so did European fascism. But it is sad to see this country, the poetry-loving India in which I was raised, often adopting such extremist and brazenly anti-art attitudes. So, yes, the state is derelict in its duty of protection, but the people too must be asked to think again, to refuse the ugly simplicities of those who brand artists as their enemies. Art is not the enemy of the people. It is the work which for future generations will tell the story of what our time was like. The artist is the people's ambassador to, to the future. I am asking in short for a better understanding of what art is and a greater respect for the people who make it. And central to that understanding is the principle that art seeks to open the universe. And it does so according to the vision of each individual artist. And if it is not cherished, not given the space in which such visions can flower, then it will die and with it will perish the collective imagination of the human race. It will inevitably be the case that individual works of art will step on the toes of this group or that group, will shock and challenge and offend some of us. 
That is the price an open society pays for its openness. And we must simply learn to deal with it, to turn away from what we dislike towards the things we love. If India goes down the road of communalized culture, it will make no mistake alienate many of those in the outside world who currently admire it. If this becomes a culture of intolerance, well, there are many such countries in the world. And were India to fall into that group, it would lose its unique standing in the international community. Let us not become another closed world, another China, another Iran, another Pakistan. Let our universe remain open and let us strive to open it further. I just want to emphasize in closing that what I'm saying is not in the name of some alien, incompatible Western idea of liberty, but in the name of the ancient and astonishingly liberal and sophisticated culture which it is our privilege to share. In the Ibadat Khana of Hadapur Sikri, the Emperor Akbar's celebrated house of debate in which many ideas of the world, conservative and innovative, Muslim and non-Muslim, could confront one another, there is a better model for Indian Islam than the narrow sectarianism of some modern Imams. I was recently listening to my friend, the filmmaker Deepa Mehta, speak of how deeply her filmmaking is inspired by the principles embodied in the Natya Shastra. And I was reminded of the story near the beginning of that great work, when the first play is performed at the Festival of the Banner before the, an audience of the gods, a reenactment of the victory of good over evil, of Indra's defeat of the Asuras. The Asuras, you recall, arrived to object to the play, claiming that their portrayal of the play was offensive to them, um, rather a modern complaint and paralyzing the speech, movements, and memory of the actors in reprisal. The reaction of the highest gods is noteworthy. Indra, furious, destroyed the evil spirits and said that his banner pole would henceforth be the symbol of the protection that must be afforded to actors and plays. Brahma asked the architect of heaven, Vishwakarma, to construct a safe space, a theater in which the performances could take place, and the gods themselves would guarantee to, to serve as the guardians of that space. And with this, Brahma's defense of the freedom of art, the theater was born. That is the true tradition of this country, and we would do well to abide by it. As Tagore asks us in his immortal poem, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out of the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever-widening thought and action, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. Thank you.